Hey ladies and gents, and welcome to the Controlled Interest Gamecast, where we talk about video games and everything happening in the industry, episode 103. I am Jared White, your host. As always, I'm joined by Dom. And we're also joined by my boy here, if you're watching on video, you can see my, my, <laughs> wolf, my wolf friend with his boombox. It kind of I mean, looks like... an audio. Yeah. It kind of looks like, a, what's a Telltale game? Fables? Fable? Kind of looks like that guy, Bigsby or whatever, the main character. Yeah, like, like Bigby. Big B, there you go. Bit. I don't know why I said Big B. If he B. got a little more, if he had like a little hip hop style going into him, yeah, I could see it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so episode 103, going to be talking about what we've been playing. Sadly, I didn't really play much, so I'll tell you what happened. Finish the podcast on Thursday, recording anyways, they go up on Sundays. Friday comes around, and I'm sitting there, Dom, and I'm debating. I had this age-old debate in my head. Do I get Octopath Traveler, or do I get Captain Toad Treasure Tracker? <sighs> I'm like, one's a brand new game, one's an older game that's a poor... I mean, I'm excited for both of them. I'm just going through my head weighing which one I'm going to well, buy, right? Before you finish, before you finish, I mean, this is actually one of those weird scenarios where there's actually demos for both of those games. Exactly, yeah. I've actually played so, them both. Yeah, that should I'm, help. I've played yeah. them both. I'm excited for both of the games. It was just like, I don't have $100 to buy both. Which one do I want to buy? So I was just going into my head of like, which one I enjoyed more. I think they both are great. Um, one's 40, one's 60, so I'm like, oh, $20 off, that's great. But, like, Octopath just kept calling me, kept calling me, so I ended up purchasing Octopath. Um, looking through the characters, so there's eight different characters, each of them have a skill set going into the game that helps you in some way, right? That's the whole point of having eight different characters. So I did my research, and I looked at what each one's ability was. And for me, the Scholar was the, the best choice for me for my first run-through, because... Um, a, it's like the character I must associate with personally. Um, just his backstory of like reading what his like story is going to be. And my scholar, John. yeah. <laughs> and his make up for Jordan being gone. Right, his little wit quips. Um, and his ability uh, shows you weaknesses of enemies. So for me, the way I play RPGs and stuff, I love that. Like knowing the weaknesses is more important to me than like. Maybe double stacking damage on a certain ability or finding out, like, information for something. I love knowing a weakness going in. I like that tactical advantage. So I was like, I'm going with him. Started the game. Voice acting's cool. It's weird because it does one of those things that you can tell from a non-AAA game where they don't have the budget to entirely voice all of the game. So they make sure to voice the important parts, right? So that's a little jarring, but it's some, something I have to do with a smaller scale game like this. Game's beautiful. I've literally only played 10 minutes of it, so I can't give you any other impressions. All I know is, yes, it's as be- beautiful as it's looked in its first 10 minutes, and the voice acting I thought was pretty good for what I expected. Um, other than that, I've been playing some more, more Marvel Strike Force, uh, trying to get Wasp because they added her to the game uh, for, obviously, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Um, I didn't watch anything... Uh, I have some stuff I want to talk about for next week at the end of the show that I'm excited for. But yeah, it just was a, wasn't was a big week for me in terms of uh, watching stuff or playing stuff, really. I was kind of busy with a lot of things, but I dabbed my foot into Octopath Traveler. So, What about you? It's been calling me, too. I didn't end up buying it, but I, I feel like I may pretty soon here. Um, the, the biggest reason I didn't is because I am still you know, uh, ways deep in uh, uh, Hollow Knight. Played a bunch of that, um, and I still really like it. I can't say anything new. I mean, it, it gets more fun the more abilities you get, you know, and uh, you get that cool feeling of like, ah, now I got the double jump. I, I can remember in my head like the two or three spots where I couldn't reach before. Now I'm gonna head back and see what you know what I mean. Um, that old that old gameplay trope, but it, it's the funner. Metroidvania I, I thing it. of but, like, oh, I have a new ability to access a new area. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was strong in, in Zelda, too. I'm going to just put that out there. Anyway, um, the one thing, because I've, I've only done, I've only praised it so far. I will say I've come across, like, what I find now to me, like, a, kind of a, a a fundamental flaw in how the game is designed. Um, but I, I don't want to, you know, it's, I don't want to totally fault them. And actually, before I go into that, this game is $15, and that to me is crazy. This could be a $30 game easily. Oh, yeah. It's really big. <clears throat> Um, and really polished too. Um, so just with that in mind, I do, what I found is I hate, um, you collect money and you have to, you know, choose, do I continue on or, you know, do I go spend this money or, you know, do I continue on and risk losing it after dying twice, just like in a souls game. Right. 
The difference here is in this game, you can't go to any you know bench and spend your money like you could in Dark Souls and level up. You have to actually go back and you know find the shopkeeper that has the thing you want to buy. Or I found one bank so far where you can bank your money, but then it's like. I assume there's hopefully more of these banks in the game, but then it's like, I got to go find that bank if I want my money back and then go back to the shopkeeper. I need it. to me. Like, that's like, I don't know. It's just wrong. It shouldn't be like that. Um, you should be able to bank your money at least or spend it at benches to me. Maybe that's just cause I'm used to the souls games actually in this case, holding my hand through that process compared to hollow Knight. Um, but I didn't. I, I lost like you know two thousand dollars or whatever, which is like more money than I had ever had in the game at any point thus far. And, and it wasn't even because I had you know I had beat a boss. I went back to a bench and I was on my way back to uh, you know the shop owner that I wanted to go see and and I died and got unlucky and died again and it just pissed me off and I was like you know th- there should be a better way to handle this. Maybe there's a mechanic I don't know of or that I get later on, but right now that is pissing me off. Yeah. Um, kind of come to that realization my to me i mean dark souls 3 you have to go back to the base to level up so remember you can't that you is don't, true you You're don't right. level you up go... at the bonfire you level up at the uh what's that's true yeah but you can you know go to the last bonfire you've been at and then travel back right yeah but there is a fast travel system in hollow knight the beetles so you can fast travel to the the shops yeah I'm not. I'm not saying that your complaints unwarranted. Yeah. I completely understand where you're coming from. I'm just saying that there are solutions, and I mean, every game isn't going to have everything perfect for you necessarily. There are going to be some things that like are going to bother right. you. So for me, that's not necessarily an issue because I'm like, oh, there's fast travel beetles, and they're usually close to where those shops are. But I, I completely understand your concern. You, it's justified. You know, I completely see where you're coming from. Yeah, it's just it's a and dude, this is like the first thing in a game that I'm otherwise like just absolutely infatuated with yeah and it's not a deal breaker by any means it's just something i realized like i need to i want to point that out because to me it's a little messed up and i I don't like how that's handled um i think in better games uh, too you tend to you tend to find those things that you dislike a lot easier because so much of the game you enjoy so when you encounter something that's like counterintuitive to everything else you've experienced in that game you're like oh wait this doesn't i don't like this (laughs) you know so it jumps out a lot more whereas if you're playing like a subpar game it's like well, okay, I won't fault him for that because it could be better, but whatever. That, you know, so you, they kind of start stacking up so they don't stick out so much like a sore thumb. But in a good game that you enjoy, it's like, ooh, this is like a glaring thing to me because everything else is so good. So, yeah, I completely see where you're coming from. Not an issue for me, but I yeah, I think it's justified. Did you play yeah, anything but else? Otherwise, I still really love the game. Um, I, the only, I only played a little bit more of Battlefront. I still haven't beat that campaign. I put a little bit more time into it, and it's still... Which know, is crazy, because it's only, like, three or four hours long, right? It's not even that... I think it could extend to, like, five, I think. Yeah. Um, well, there's the... Which, didn't they add the you, free be at least extension? In. They added, like, the free extension, That's right? right, and I haven't even gotten to that. Yeah. Yeah. And I haven't even gotten to that yet. <laughs> but <laughs> I only I only sat down with it this past week the one time for, like, an hour. But Do you think it's I crazy? Haven't finished. Like, I, at this point, I need to finish it, you know, like... If we could go back to 2013, and this is saying that we knew each other because I don't think we we started the podcast till 2016, but if we go back to 2013 and see that deal of EA signs exclusive deal with Star Wars and to jump five years later and see that there's only one Star Wars game out and it's okay for most people, you know what I mean? It's kind of disappointing, man. It sucks. Oh, it's like two, two games, but, but yeah, that doesn't help. Well, I guess, yeah, yeah technically Battlefront, Battlefront 2, but... I mean, neither of those games stack up to, like, what a Star Wars game that people wanted would be, if that makes sense. Like, a complete package. Yeah. I get what you're saying, though. Um, Either way, you're right. It, it seems like they've really under-delivered in, in, that, in five years, and they've only had a Battlefront, two Battlefront games, both of which have not been received, you know. A Battlefront well, game with only overall. multiplayer, and a second one with multiplayer and a kind of short story mode. <laughs> so it's like, you know. Right. Yeah. It's unfortunate. And a canceled game and just a, mm, a loot yeah, box exactly. controversy. Just, mm, guys. So we didn't play a lot, so we're going to offset that by talking about a bunch of news that came out this week. We're starting to get into the mode nearing Gamescom and obviously San Diego Comic-Con, the weekend of us recording this. We're recording now on the cusp of the early panel starting and stuff like that on Thursday. Um, 
Let's talk about some news. So the first news, uh, Jump Ship, Jump Ship Studio, is the studio that uh, former Play Dead CEO Dino Patti started up after he left. Um, and obviously Play Dead are the makers of Inside and Limbo. And uh, in June of last year, 2017, they revealed the first look at their game Somerville, which is this sci-fi... It's basically like Limbo or Inside, but sci-fi with aliens and some weird stuff going on. Um, and the studio started with Dino Patti alongside Chris Olsey, who's a film animator. And they basically shared a new teaser trailer for the game in celebration of uh, this hiring drive that they're going to be doing to upgrade the studio in terms of manpower. And uh, this is all caused by a couple of companies buying minority stakes in Jump Ship. Um, one of them being NetEast, which is a uh, pretty big uh, like software company that does these kind of investments. Um, obviously, we're both excited for this. We both saw the teaser trailer, Dom, and the animation looked incredible. It's like kind of what we expect from people that are associated with Play Dead in any way. Uh, what I want to know from you are like, what are your expectations for this game? And also, the question I have is, obviously this game is a ways off, right? Uh, Inside took five years to develop. They're basically ramping up studio the studio now um, for this. Um, do you think that this will be like the first indie darling on next gen? Because I assume this is going to come out next gen, right? I highly doubt this hits PS4 or Xbox One. Um, do you think this will be the first <clears throat> game on next gen where it's like, oh, dang, this is the indie darling for this gen right off the bat? Um, I don't know. I would have said yes, but... The the way I mean, looking at that, yeah, the animation is really good, and the way the way you kind of laud that, and then if we look back to E3, and I made the comment like, wow, that that next piece of Cuphead content is a really long ways off. I would have thought they've gotten some processes streamlined by now, and they could come quicker. I think you might be right. You mentioned well, those animations are even if you got it down, that takes a while to to put that together. And if if you're right again here, and the animations take a lot of time, this might not make. You know, the initial next, it might be two, a year or two into the next gen. Uh, yeah. In which case, I'd say there's probably going to be a cooler indie game. Well, not necessarily cooler, but, or better, but, you know, there's an indie be darling, indie before, darling this. before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it works out like, like you're predicting, and I agree with you. So, Inside came out two years ago. They're already working on their next game. So, we assume if it's the same dev cycle that comes out in 2021, which is, we'll talk about later, some rumors about the next Xbox coming out in 2020. So, I'd be on the cusp of next gen. This game, if it's if they're high, ramping up now, it's probably been in pre-pro and stuff. So, give them the benefit of the doubt four years instead of five. That means we're looking at okay. 2022. Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting if, if Play Dead's next game and this game launched in the same year. That would be very interesting because you see the the the, the yeah. award lauded company going up against the former CEO and seeing how they both. I mean, my I don't really think that one's going to be like a failure. I think they're both going to be solid. I'm just interested to see like what Dino Patty's vision is for a game that kind of had him break away from Play Dead. Like what he wanted to do. Did he want it to evolve it in a different direction? Did he want to like do something entirely like creatively new that Play Dead kind of want to stay in their own path? Like I want to see where that differentiates. You know that line in the sand. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. Like we both watched that teaser trailer, and <laughs> though it's like a 15 second teaser trailer with like literally n not much happening, I was super invested in it already. Like there's yeah, just like this dog yeah. crossing a river and these two guys and you're like, what are they trying to get away from? And then you see like these alien like red lights, <laughs> these sci-fi like warnings. And you're like, oh, they're running from whatever's invaded this planet. Because if you remember, the original teaser was like this like uh, cabin uh, in this open woodsy area and like lights flashed in the sky and you saw this giant like alien monolith behind it. So ah, it's so intriguing. We don't have an idea of Play Dead's next game, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, no, we do. Isn't it the astronaut game? Didn't they show, like, a screenshot of, like, an astronaut or something? I think it is. Um, while I'm looking this up... That um, sounds... It sounds... In, uh, what, do you, what do you think? I don't know. A uh, question for you. Familiar. While I'm looking astronaut. this up, do me a favor. What do you think... With this Somerville game, do you think it's going to be like Limbo and Inside where it has a very open-to-interpretation narrative, or do you think this is going to have like a set story? I don't know, because, I mean, people really like... I haven't played Inside, so... Um, but I think mostly people really love that. And correct me if I'm wrong, was that kind of a more open-to-interpretation? 
open for interpretation kind of story. Uh, yes. That's my assumption. Even, even, I would say even more so than Limbo was. Okay. Yeah. So, and I, but I did see a handful of people, you know, come out of inside, like, I don't really know what happened, but I didn't really like that game, and this is weird, right? Yeah. Um, which, I mean, that's, I, you could say, like, well, you need to understand, like, this is what they're trying to say. I don't know. You know what I mean? So maybe this isn't the way they built that. Maybe they'll try this time around to make it a little more uh, narratively, narrative, narratively, what the fuck am I trying to say? It, you know, accessible, a more accessible narrative uh, that doesn't take so much, you know, analysis to understand, maybe. But I, I would like to think they're not going to do that just to cater to a, a couple people who thought Inside was just weird and they didn't get it. But how many... How? <sighs> This is the just the former CEO that's coming over to the new studio, right? Yeah. Okay. I don't know enough about him or his input on Inside and how much you know about the this trailer looked like literally looked like Inside to me. Um, so I'm getting the vibe that he's got a lot of input on what you know each of these game how what went into Inside and what's coming into this game. But I don't know. It's I don't know enough about uh, their his process, I guess, and what what his role is there. Yeah, so the the thing is, you haven't played Inside, obviously. Have you seen the movie Annihilation with Natalie Portman? It's based on the books. No, I, I've been. I actually really want to. But. Okay, so that movie very much has an open to interpretation ending. Spoiler: I don't think that's a spoiler. But like, it's not a set narrative ending, right? It's not like everything's wrapped up in a bow. Inside, I, I from what you've heard said, I know why you don't like Limbo. Inside is different. Like, it is open to interpretation, but there's a lot more. There's a lot more strings that you can position however you want them. You know what I mean? Whereas Limbo is just like, figure it out, you know? Whereas Inside gives you a lot of these like strings to just like, attach these where you want to and come up come up with your own conclusion. Um, though there is like a very strong like narrative through line there that you can be like, this is a story if you don't want to read too much into it. Um, anyways, that being said, I was correct. So their next game, they showed that image of like this guy with like a parachute that's like ripped up and he's walking up a mountainside and there's like a comet coming down and he's like in an astronaut suit and they actually released it at, like a couple of weeks after Inside came out and they, uh, said thank you for your reception of Inside. Playdead's founder, Art Jensen and the team have been working on the next adventure. So this is interesting because if this is if this is tied to Aliens Two and sci-fi, then it's going to be a direct competitor to Somerville. You know what I mean? Um, whereas, right. w- w- from what we've seen with Somerville, it seems like Somerville might be about the alien invasion, whereas uh, Play Dead's next game might be about the mystery of a comet landing on Earth, kind of thing. You know? So we'll see. And and there's a good chance it's safe to assume that like you know the the ideas for each of these games each of these new games you know were shared exactly you know, from a, a ways back right that both uh, these studios you know know what the other one is or at least what it was on um, the first idea of it so well i mean jensen and patty worked together for a long time between inside and limbo so like two creatives working together like that when you find Definitely, inspiration yeah. when a creative finds inspiration they're not willing to let that go because it's so hard to find it so i'm pretty sure they're like let's do a sci-fi alien kind of thing and then they had their falling out and patty was probably like i still want to do something related to that i think there's a cool nugget there and that's going to be interesting because then we will see where jensen and patty differentiate in terms of the game they want to make right so really yeah. cool the, the thing is, is Patty, I think, understands how important the animation is in the games he wants to make because he went and teamed up with a film animator, Chris Olsey, and from what we've seen from the mm-hmm. teasers, the animation's really good, too. Um, it's kind of up, up to par so far from what we've seen with Inside. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited. Um, I think we both are. Hopefully we see them before we die. Hopefully they come out in the next couple of years. Um, yeah. Inside is on Switch, so I'm going to play it soon. I promise. So good. Um, next up, a short story. Um, Madden's long shot story mode is returning. Uh, this is by Jason Trier via Kotaku. I would normally say go and read the full story, but it's literally like two lines that he posted. Um, so Madden revealed the cover athlete uh, this week, which is weird. It's two weeks out from launch. They've never really done this. They usually announce the cover athlete even before E3. Um, but it's going to be Antonio Brown, which is fine. Whatever. I don't... I'm, I have nothing against the Steelers. I don't. I don't, I don't mind this either way. My only gripe with Madden is that I wish they put more defensive players on the cover. But obviously, people like to see the offensive players. Like I would love to see Luke Keekley or somebody else on the cover. But it is what it is. Anyways, 
and there was a big like you know like I think Ray Lewis was on there once maybe or someone from the Ravens. But then like did no one from like the Seahawks you know make the cover from their defense when it was like oh the Legion of Boom and they were like popular right? Yeah, like, Richard Sherman was, was on all, the cover in 2015. Oh, there, there have been defensive okay, players. Okay. Yeah, I'm just saying. I, the not very frequently though. Exactly. Yeah, it's like one defensive player every like. I think Richard Sherman was the first defensive player since Troy Polamalu shared the cover with Larry Fitzgerald. That one year where there was like two Madden cover athletes. Anyways, uh-huh. during the cover athlete, hey, you know what? Where are my offensive linemen, Madden? Damn it! Oh God, that's another yeah. step. Yeah. God. Um, during this cover reveal, though, they also talked about the long shot mode returning, and this one's going to be called Long Shot Homecoming, which is funny because of the Spider-Man thing. Um, but so EA confirmed that it's returning, and they said it will offer more control over Devin Wade and Colt Cruz's football adventure. I have some concerns with this, Dom. So I liked Long Shot mode a lot. To most people, they would think that more control over the two characters means that, like, oh, the story's going to be bigger. There's going to be a lot more to do. To me, I think this is a very PR way of saying we're trading out some narrative cinematic stuff for just you playing more games of Madden. You know what I mean? That's what I'm worried about of them like – Look at you. Yeah. You have more – Cynical EA. (laughs) No, I actually like EA out of us three. I I think I'm usually the most optimistic out of us because I – anyways – I think it's the way of, of doing this. It's weird that they're announcing this a couple of weeks before the game's coming out, though the cover reveal is also weird. So I don't know if they just had some like licensing issues with like figuring out who was going to be the cover athletes. So they're like, let's just save this long shot announcement since we can't do it at E3. Save her for when we announce the cover athlete. I'm not reading too much into that. Just the verbiage that I'm more concerned with. I wonder if this is going to be a watered-down version of the story mode. Like, I wonder if it didn't pay enough dividends for them to do it. Um, because they did get some big name actors in it. I wonder if they're like, we're going to deliver it again, but we're not going to even, you know, put enough effort into it. I could be wrong. It could be great, but the verbiage they're using about more control and stuff like that just seems to me like they're going to be exchanging narrative story elements for you get to play more games than Madden, you know, cause that was one of the big gripes with long shot, uh, last year is that people were like, you only play like five games in the entire story mode. And I'm like, well, that's. It's a, a story. You're not. If you want to play Madden, play Madden, right? So, I don't know. Do you think I'm reading too much into it? You think I'm being too cynical? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, for one, I look at like, look at like Apple, right? When they're making iPhones, and they, I, I don't know if they've. I don't think. I'm pretty sure they've actually actively admitted it. They said it in a better way, where like they hold features back, right? They could put two new features on the next iPhone, and then, or they could put five more. But they're going to hold some back for the next iPhone and the next iPhone, right? Exactly. Um, and they have competition still. Madden has no competition, uh, in, at least in other football games. Um, so, and even other sports games, that's hardly competition either because it's pretty much all EA also. Well, they um, even got rid of so the yeah, NCAA so, I mean, game. So they don't even have a direct competitor from themselves because there's no more NCAA. Yeah. There you go. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I, you're, I think you're absolutely right. I mean – Reading through the lines a little bit of like, you know, maybe we're we're pulling this back a bit, um, yeah, more just ch- changing it, not necessarily improving it, right? Oh, we're gonna add in uh, more games, but yeah, that probably means less story. But that way, the following year, you'd be like, oh, well, now we're really revamping the story aspect of this game, and it's like, you know what I mean? Just kind of extending it for the sake of extending it, but that's what you should, that's the smartest business move they can make in the position they are, right? Well, the weirdest um, thing is they didn't even announce Marsh, uh, Marshala Ali, the actor, was in last year's long shot mode, right? He's like a, a award-winning actor. They didn't even mention that. So, like, to me, I'm worried that there's not going to be any big-name actors in this version at all. But at the same time, they didn't announce it last year, so there could be, right? The funny thing is, guess what they made sure to mention? You can take them and use them in Ultimate Team. Of course you can. That's their mode where they make billions of dollars. You know, of course they're going to let you take these story characters. And that's my worry, is that it's going to be less narrative driven. You're going to play more games of Madden. And then the focus is going to be on you finishing the story to get them to Mutt because they want you to get into that game mode as soon as possible because that's where they make the most money. Um, and I like Madden Ultimate mm. Team. I don't think they pressure you with microtransactions. I think the trade off of play time to putting money into the game is fine. I don't have any issues with it. But I really like Longshot, and I'm worried that it's not going to live up to what I enjoyed so much last year, which is weird. I never thought I'd be worried about a story mode in Madden because I never thought there would be one. We'll see, though. I don't know. Maybe I'm just worrying for no reason. We'll, we'll end up finding out. <laughs> um, yeah, it comes out August 10th, Dom. It comes out in a couple of weeks, and we're basically barely hearing about this stuff. It's very weird. 
Um, something I, else. I assumed when I saw the story, really quick, when I saw the story about the cover athlete, I thought, what that must be for like Madden 2020 then, right? Because surely, this one's already out, right? Or I mean, you know, already announced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never mind. Like you know, you're right. It's late. I don't even follow it, but I can tell that's late. Yeah. Personally, I wanted uh, Todd Gurley, the running back for the Rams, on the cover. Um, I knew they weren't going to put anybody Ooh. from the Eagles because, like, you're not going to put a backup quarterback on the cover of Madden. Nick Foles wouldn't have made the cover, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. Brandon so, Graham, the hero. Yeah, right. Um, the next news story is about something also happening in August. The Xbox, uh, basically, inside Xbox at Gamescom. So... We know that they don't do a press conference at Gamescom anymore, but now that they have Inside Xbox, they're going to be doing that show live from Gamescom. Last year they did uh, an Xbox showcase, um, but it wasn't a press conference or anything. It was the same thing. It was a live stream where they talked about a bunch of stuff. Um, Over on Major Nelson's blog, they announced that they're going to be at Gamescom doing Inside Xbox, and they're going to be showcasing 25 games, probably games we've seen, games coming out, and they also said a couple of new games that we're, we are don't know are coming to Xbox. I'm assuming probably PC ports. I doubt we'll see any major announcements of games, but who knows. Um, I, you know what I would love to see, Dom? I would love to see them showcase Biomutant. Um, I want to see more of that game. We know it's going to be oh, at yeah. Gamescom. I would love to have Xbox put that on their, on their stage for Inside Xbox. That'd be really cool. They're also going to be showcasing Xbox bundles and accessories. And the biggest guess here is that we're going to be seeing the second version of the Elite Controller. The really uh, nice, really good $150 controller from Xbox. There have been rumblings about a second version of that controller. And people also think we're going to be seeing bundles. And my assumption, like I told you before we started recording, is that they're currently doing a competition to give away a PUBG bus. I would almost bet money on one of those bundles being a PUBG uh, bundle. Maybe even with a custom design console. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to be Xbox One X. We'll see. Uh, not a whole lot here. The thing I want to talk to you about is people uh, uh, immediately when they heard all this news about hardware being at the show, they thought Xbox was going to show off Project Scarlet, the new Xbox that they talked about at E3 briefly. Why on earth did anybody think they'd talk about the next Xbox during Gamescom? Yeah, it's just not going to happen. No. <laughs> Like in what world does that make sense? I don't understand the, it, the, the the part of this too is that there's a lot of rumors saying that it's going to release in 2020. Like a lot of strong rumors saying that's the year the Xbox is kind of aiming for to launch the next iteration of their console. Um, one, do you believe those rumors? Does 2020 seem you know, like it can work? And two, if it was 2020, there's no way they would show their console in two years beforehand, right? That doesn't make any sense on any planet. It, it, even if I, I think 2020 is probably most likely, but I still think there's a small chance it's 2019. I mean, that's just even if that was the case, it's still that's we still wouldn't be hearing a you know what I mean? Yeah, history shows us they do an event before forum. E3, yeah, like right before. Yeah, makes no sense. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think people are just you know how like fans get they're like, oh, this could mean this. In reality, no, it's probably just this. You know, they're like, oh, it could possibly be something mm-hmm. crazy. It's like. No, it's probably not. Um, but I'm interested to see those bundles. Um, Xbox has done a very good job at pricing their bundles in really strong ways. Um, obviously, they haven't sold as many consoles as PS4, so that gives them some leeway to be like, we need to be cheaper. But like we've talked about numerous times, I don't understand why Black Friday is the only time I can get a PS4 Slim for less than $300. That does not make any sense. I'm sorry. I'm, it bothers me. Yeah. I can get an Xbox One S with a Blu-ray, 4K Blu-ray player for two hundred dollars most of the time. The sale happens like yeah, twelve times a year. And on Black Friday, like one fifty. Exactly. It bothers me. It, it, yeah, it's crazy <laughs> how like how much power they appear to have, uh, and, and you know, not they're not relinquishing it in, in their pricing. It's yeah, it's really bizarre. I think they would have been served to you know put something out there in a summer sale if it was prime day or somewhere around you know this time during their or where they had their like e3 week sale or whatever where they i think they discounted the pro by 50 bucks but not the slim yeah you know so it's bizarre well the thing too is people automatically assume that this is going to reach 100 million in units the ps4 i'm not sure obviously it's selling really well i don't know if it'll hit that um if they wanted to reach that i think they would have done you think so I don't think it's trending toward. It's at what seventy five. 
Oh, I thought it crossed 80 like last week. I heard some, maybe I'll, I'll verify that. But I just see like to me this is like when they I don't have to double check this too, but I feel like they kind of they start there's a, a you know an, a period of time towards the end where they start to sell pretty well, you know, cuz they're they're going to have a price drop. It's got to if it's not this year, then next year there's going to be a permanent price drop on it, right? And that's and then they are really going to kick out like, you know, that end of cycle kind of get these things off the shelves type of stage i don't know i just i feel like 100 million is almost certainly going to happen yeah i just think for me i think if they wanted to reach that they would have done the price drop kind of thing because like their consoles sell it just I think that's why they haven't dropped the price it just to me that they could have gone a little bit more aggressive if they wanted to like clip some crazy numbers and that's the funny thing too is people are like xbox is losing if you put xbox in a vacuum in relation to other generations it's selling extremely well it's just that ps4 is one of those anomaly consoles in a generation like the wii that's just selling extraordinarily well so in comparison yeah it's getting devastated but if you compare it to a bunch of other consoles it's doing really really well it's just funny how that stuff works out wait i mean not to mention that, like, you know, consoles sold is one metric that, I mean, <laughs> there's a hundred other, you know, things to measure. And then, you know, a thousand other factors uh, exactly that play into it. Like, there, there's no, like, there's not a, <laughs> a standard measure of, like, oh, this is it. All that matters is consoles sold. I mean, because then it'd be like, we just sell it for 10 bucks, and then we have the most sold, right? But what yeah. is that? what good does that do you? Also, Microsoft recently had their uh, quarterly earnings call, and Satya Nadal uh, talked about the Xbox division and stated it's had its most profitable, I think it had its most profitable uh, year in like the last seven years, I think, what he stated. It, something like that. But basically, they had their most profitable year in like a couple of years. So like, they're doing just fine. Um, he also talked about how they're aggressively oh, yeah. investing still. Like, he talked about how, like, they invested in studios and stuff, but, like, they're still aggressively investing. So, like we've assumed and kind of guessed and predicted, we're going to see more announcements, I think, of some other studios. I think, like, Phil Spencer and Satya Nadella are like, buy what you can. We need to get some great games on this platform. We need to get great developers. So, we'll, I think we'll see more announcements. I doubt we'll see any of them at Gamescom. Um, I would be shocked if, like, they came out and announced a studio that maybe they weren't able to get the paperwork done by E3. That was kind of already in the works. I doubt that's happening. I think that's something they save for later, but who knows. Um, the next story here, talking about earning a ton of money, Dom, uh, Fortnite's made $1 billion. Um, so according to, this is by Nick Santangelo via IGN, according to a new report from Super Data Research, Fortnite has made over $1 billion from in-game purchases, aka microtransactions. Uh, in what is considered its slowest month of the year, in May, Fortnite still generated a massive $318 million in revenue. Um, what I want to talk to you about is how long will for this Fortnite train last, and uh, are we in it for the long haul, like Minecraft? Me and you aren't really huge fans of of, of Fortnite, so it's tough. But from an ob objective uh, point of view, what do we? Th are, is this game going to be around for a while, or is it going to fizzle out, like many people anticipate? I, I mean, it's going to fizzle out, it, it, absolutely. Um, as far as when, I, I don't know, man. It's just. Because we got, you know, we're going to have Call of Duty and, and Battlefield this year. going to have Battle Royales, right? So <clears throat> that's going to take some of the, the share away from Fortnite. But but as long as, like, you know, nothing is competing with Fortnite at the free-to-play level, really. I mean, not strongly competing. So I, that's really what is going to have to – something. some things are going to have to challenge this at that level for it to, to slow it down somewhat. But even without that, I don't know, another year – We'll stop hearing about it so much. I think interest will just start to fade. Um, See, I think this I, this just doesn't last long. I think. Here's the thing. I would I would be with you on this. I my argument is I don't think it's going to be in the news cycle as much a year from now, but I do think it's still going to be rocking along, making crap tons of money. Um, because look at League of Legends, Dom. We never talk about that game. No one really in games coverage ever talks about that game. It was a saturated market with a ton of MOBAs. League of Legends still doing its thing, still going on and on. We never talk about it. It's never really in the news. But they introduce new characters. They have a thriving esports market. I think Fortnite's going to be that way. I think it may not be have the cultural zeitgeist a, a year from now. But I do think it'll continue to earn tons of money because the system they put in place, because they're epic and they they own the, the, uh, the engine that they make the game on that almost... Uh, 
every other studio makes their games on, right? The Unreal Engine. Because they own that, they can iterate so fast on new content um, and add things to the game and add new things and add dances and add emotes. They're talking about adding uh, skins for vehicles they're going to be adding, which is another in-game item that people can purchase. They're going to be adding the ability to share items with other players, which means that's another purchase avenue of you have a couple of friends, maybe one has more expendable income, and he's like, hey, I want to get you something so you don't, you're don't, you not wearing the default outfit. Let me purchase you one of the outfits, and I can gift it to you. You know, I think they're adding a lot of these other avenues to earn more money. Um, a billion dollars is a lot of money. Uh, I like, like I said though, I I think it may be out of the cultural zeitgeist a year from now, but I don't see this slowing in terms of making money, um, unless Call of Duty and Battlefield come out of the gate and extraordinary, or PUBG does something extraordinary. It being free to play is really tough, and there's this weird like mental thing of like people don't want to buy a sixty dollar game, but they'll play a free to play game and spend ten dollars a week for six weeks. You know what I mean? This weird thing of like, right. if I pay ten dollars a week, that's not pay- I'm not paying sixty dollars for a game. It's a way for them to justify it. So, I don't know. It's weird. Uh, it's tough because yeah. like me and you aren't I, like and, the Fortnite guys. So it's like you know. And it's like yeah, like Call of Duty is not going to take over you know Fortnite spot here. Obviously, right? Um, it's just like can Call of Duty, Battlefield, Red Dead Redemption. Even uh, you know Fallout seventy six uh, all this fall you know just take enough of the attention away from Fortnite for a few months you know to like get people to start to like it's you know start to forget about it a little bit um, definitely you're definitely right I mean it's going to keep making money for probably a long time right um, now is it going to make three hundred whatever million in a month next year this you know next uh, next June that that is not a chance. Yeah. in my head right i think this fall there's a lot of good online games coming out um that are just take the, enough attention away from it you know just and then that's going to create opportunity for someone else or you know someone's else to you know not necessarily just free to play but attack like that free to play market or the cheap market whatever you want to call it um and i don't know what that is or what that looks like it could be something entirely different you know um something that it's got it's something social, right? Because I see Fortnite, I just see like kids, and I don't know, and they're all talking about it. At, I don't know, I don't know, man. I'm just sick of Fortnite, to be honest. Yeah. So forget it. Uh, in happier news, let's talk about a game you do like, Horizon Zero Dawn. So obviously, that game was made by Guerrilla Games. This story comes by way of Shabana Arif over at IGN.com. Guerrilla Games looking to expand. So Guerrilla Games will be expanding their studio from 250 employees to well over 400. That's almost twice as many if you want to do the math. Uh, Herman Holst, a Guerrilla Games CEO, stated that they've been looking to expand for three to four years, and the success of Horizon Zero Dawn alongside the move to a new building um, is allowing them to do so. Guerrilla Games will be taking over an additional five floors of the building. Uh, the goal is to make games faster, according to Holst, who wants to see a three-year dev cycle. Um, I guess there's a couple of questions in here. Um, the one I, uh, I want to tackle off the top, Dom, is as somebody who, correct me if I'm wrong, loved Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, what do you want from a sequel? Like, what can they improve for you? What, what are you looking to see in the follow-up to that game? Uh, I mean, it, it'll probably be a little bit, not necessarily bigger, uh, you know, physically bigger map-wise, but... They'll probably I could I can imagine they'll add you know a lot of quests because you know a lot of the side quests uh, there's not too many of them in the in the uh, original game and I could see them expanding on that and like more interesting quests you know what I mean just kind of like going deeper into side quests and getting some more side narrative stuff going on I think would be one area the easy you know the the low hanging fruit is the melee combat it definitely needs improvement that's not really the point of the game um, you know it's more of a it's it's intended to be more of a bow and you know a ranged combat kind of game, but they still give you you know your spear that you can use up close, but it's really clunky and really annoying to use, except for like your takedown type moves. But um, I think they could really overhaul the whole like melee combat and make that you know, a whole new thing because the like the bow and arrow combat is pretty darn flawless in that game. It feels fantastic, so I think they could turn their attention to the melee stuff uh, and you know revamp some of that. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Otherwise. For you. I didn't, sorry to interrupt you. I have a couple of questions it, it for you. It does a lot, right? 
So one, yep. most of, if not all of the robots are based on prehistoric creatures, right? Because I know not all of them are dinosaurs because there's like one that's kind of like based on a saber tooth a little bit, right? Yeah. So there's none that are based off just like a normal animal. They're all prehistoric, right? Yeah. I mean, there's some that are, are not, they're not any dinosaurs. They're not based on any dinosaurs I recognize, but certainly not any animals either. There's a few that I'm like, I don't know what that's supposed to so be. In know? a Horizon sequel, um, could you see, like, does the world justify, like, maybe some robots that look like gorillas or rhinos or elephants or stuff like that? Or is those a little bit too, like, that doesn't match the other robots in terms of design? I mean, in terms of design, they would match. They could certainly do that. I'm just I'm trying to remember, like, narratively, if that would make sense. Um, yeah. I know there's, like, in the DLC, there's, like, a big, you know, giant uh, polar bear uh, oh, okay. guy. I don't know if there was something prehistoric that matches that. I mean, bears have been around about. forever. But it was so, definitely... Yeah. Right. So, I mean, maybe it's justified in that way, and I just... I don't think about a polar bear as a... Or that, you know... It, as a dinosaur, but um, I, I need to, to be honest. I need a refresher on like what would narratively fit, you know, outside yeah. of your standard dinosaurs. Because I know they can design it to fit in. And there, mesh. I think I'm there's just, some limitation there. Yeah, I'm just understanding. I'm trying to understand if like what animals don't make sense narratively. Like, why was that mixed in with all this? Um, the other question I have for you is what biomes are missing? Because obviously the DLC had snow, but like, did Horizon Zero Dawn have like a desert biome or a jungle biome? Or were they more like temperate, like? foresty areas throughout yeah it was it was a lot of forest um there was already like a snowish area and then the dlc you know made it an even larger snowy area there was a desert area um you know or like a brown orange looking area um and that was actually that was probably like half the map right so half the map was that kind of like desert area or maybe a third of the map was that desert area you know a third was there like a more swamp? lush kind of green forest area I don't think so. I mean, maybe a few parts of the forest got a little swampy, but there wasn't anything predominantly like that, you know, just swampy. Was there an alligator just... enemy? Yeah. Oh, yep. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Because I was really thinking of like a giant swampy alligator. area. <laughs> yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah, I'm. this is a game, also, when I get my PS4, it's a game I want to come around to playing because I think it definitely hits everything I look for. Just like giant dinosaur robots is awesome. Um yeah, looks really cool. Uh, I'm interested in a sequel. Do you think if they are going to be working on two games at once, Dom? Obviously, they're going to be working on the Horizon sequel. Do you think they'll go back to the Kill Zone drawing board, or do you think Sony's like, "Hey, you killed it with one new IP. Just try something else. Like we trust you. Try another new IP." Because like to me, I hate to say it. I know people are going to hate me for this. I don't think Kill Zone is really bankable anymore, right? Like I think they can move on from that and try something else. Like, do they need to yeah. go back to kill zone? I don't know. I mean, I mean, you got to assume like something's you know some ideas have been being kicked around, and there's probably something in pre-production with kill zone on it, right? Um, at least, if not further. But along, is it no. gorilla? Like, that's I mean, the thing. I, I'm like, does the gorilla need to work on kill zone? Because like, I don't know. It's it's tough. Because uh, even they talked about not really they wanting need to work to? on. It. I don't know. Yeah. I don't. I mean, I think they they definitely are. I think someone or some a couple people, you know, maybe only a handful. Or doing something with Killzone. I think that's yeah. like absolutely right. Even if it doesn't end up becoming anything, there are at least some ideas are thrown around, uh, you know, that are still in whatever kind of stage. Um, and I think that's the, kind of the decision that, you know, that they're looking at right now and that they're probably talking with Sony, like, do we even do this or should we, or, you know, and maybe, maybe that depends on, I, I think at this point, honestly, Sony is probably like open to listening to new ideas instead of going back to Killzone, right? Um, yeah. Because, yeah, like, they've been granted, oh, we're expanding, right? You know, you guys killed it with uh, killed it with Horizon, so, like, here's the keys, you know what I mean? Here's some budget, here's some extra five floors or whatever you said it was. Um, it's double, almost double the staff. Uh, but I think that also, with that also comes, like, well, we have other ideas, too. Yeah, we're definitely going to do a Horizon sequel, but here's some other, here's something else we had in the works that we think is pretty cool. And I think Sony would definitely listen to it at this point. But I still think we will see there's something going on there with Killzone. I don't know if it ever, you know, materializes in anything, but I think it's they're thinking about it. That's that's certainly an option they're considering. 
Yeah, during the no clip uh, documentary about Horizon Zero Dawn, Herman Holtz talked about the process of coming up with uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, and he said that everyone had a pitch me uh, uh, they had a pitch uh, event, it wasn't necessarily a meeting where all the employees were open to bringing their pitches for what they want to do or try, and they listened to all of them. And Horizon Zero Dawn was mostly one idea, but with a couple of other ideas people had mixed in. And the cool thing with the pitches was that you didn't have to bring a game concept. If you're an artist, you could bring concept concept art if you're a programmer you could bring a mechanic you wanted to put in a game like it was very open to whatever you wanted to bring in terms of a pitch and i thought that was really cool um I, I love that open working environment like that i think it creates great product as we saw with horizon zero dawn i think people being able to have a say in what they're making tends to result in a good game right if you enjoy going to work and working on what you're making um the thing with horizon zero dawn 2 and then like kill zone is i don't think and i could be stepping out of line here i know i'm i don't own a playstation but from seeing how everybody feels i think if you were to show a a kill zone game and then have the gorilla logo i don't think that does much anymore i think with with gorilla they want people want to see horizon zero dawn 2 and they want to see something else i think that like having the gorilla name attached to Killzone do, doesn't do much for either of them anymore. You know what I mean? I think Killzone being made by a different studio oh, yeah. is just as exciting or interesting to people as Gorilla working on it. I don't think... Because when if people see Gorilla working on it, they're like, they spend time on this? Like, Killzone will be okay, but like Killzone is always like a launch title, you know? It's kind of like with uh, Dead Rising for Xbox. It's like the Dead Rising games are good. They're never great. You know what I mean? So it's like, why have Gorilla waste time on that? Um, but that's just my opinion. I know. I, I, I agree with no, you. There's no, you're right. working it's, on it, but it's like, why? <laughs> I'd rather see new IP. I think, well, yeah. I think, I think no matter what, I mean, the next thing we see from Gorilla Games is Horizon 2. Oh, 100%. It, right? I think yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Like, thousand percent, like, that's what, that's what we see next from them. Um, if, if I'm right, and maybe they're doing some stuff with Killzone, if we ever do see Killzone from them, it won't be for, for a good while. Like, we're seeing Horizon next from them. Absolutely. Yeah. I just I think that if in order to bring that franchise back, I think they need to rejuvenate it somehow, some way. Maybe even have the type of thing where it's it has a lot of the core shooting mechanics of Killzone, but it's so different that you don't know it's Killzone until the logo pops up, kind of thing. That would be interesting. Yeah. Um, but I do think that franchise is just in a weird that. place with the success of Horizon Zero Dawn. Because like if Horizon Zero Dawn was a bad game and it flopped, then it's like. Well, maybe we just go back to Killzone to try to make things work, but because it was such a success, it's like. They're so invigorated by new IP and this new world they have. Do they really want to go back to this bland, gray, and black shooter? You know, we'll see. Um, the other thing I just thought of, back to your first question um, about uh, you know what could be different in the Horizon sequel. Maybe some multiplayer. I don't know. Maybe ooh, some that'd be cool. We yeah, saw, we saw Monster Hunter was real successful. I mean, it's got they got to be thinking about it, right? I would love I a Last of like, but. I would love a Last of Us type multiplayer, like a very survival based, um, low amount of players, uh, low amount of like uh, materials and resources. That'd be really interesting. Like PvP though. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be. Interesting. I was thinking more co op, but I'd be yeah. Co op would be cool know. too, we'll like a horde mode kind of thing, but not necessarily tons of enemies. Just like they keep stacking the odds against mm. you. That'd be really interesting. Yeah. Um, Speaking of stacking the odds against you, uh, Mr. Nathan Drake, we had an Uncharted fan film come out. We talk, I don't know if we talked about it on the show last week. Maybe we did, about Nathan Fillion teasing something. We did. Yeah, with the Drake picture yeah. and the Signum Parvis Magnum or whatever the saying is. I know I butchered Sick that. Parvis Magna. There you go. Um, the fan film was Greatness great. Greatness from small beginnings. The fan film was about 11 to 12 minutes. They had Nathan Fillion as, as Nathan Drake. They had Stephen Lang from... Avatar and uh, Cable hopeful that was possibly going to be Cable in the Deadpool 2 movie. Um, he played Sully. Um, I don't know the actress's name that played Elena. Is that her name? Yeah, we don't necessarily know that that was her. I mean, we, I guess assume. It's assumed, we assume. We um, assume. It didn't re- really look like her the way that Sully looked like Sully. I don't know. Yeah. Um, that was just my vibe. I think it's just that she probably wasn't as important to the narrative for that fan film. So, like... Especially with maybe like budget and timing, they're like Stephen Lang is like a known actor, and so is Nathan Fillion. So it's like, I'm not no disrespect to that actress, but you know what I mean. 
the I think the guy we'll get into the actual fan film, but like even the guy who they casted as the villain, I loved his like James Earl Jones voice, like such a like a deep commanding voice. Um, the the uh, the El Tigre is actually the guy from the Ninja Turtles movies, um, the guy the pizza guy. Oh, um, people were you okay. know people older than us were losing their minds about that. I wasn't really much. I love the Ninja Turtles, but those those movies were a little bit too cheesy and like outdated for me personally. Um, anyways, the fan film was great. Obviously, I'm talking from a, from a perspective of somebody who's had experience with the Uncharted series. I've never beat one of the games, but I through osmosis and playing a little bit of it, I know a lot about Uncharted and what makes Uncharted Uncharted. Obviously, not as much as Dom, who will talk about it shortly. Um, but I thought they nailed it. Everyone who's constantly said that Nathan Fillion is Nathan Drake and he should play them were correct. He gets the mannerisms down. He gets the voice down. He gets the quippy charm down. Um, he just nailed it completely. I think the person who wrote this nailed it as well. I think they got what makes an Uncharted feel like an Uncharted. Um, all of the historical things, I think that's something that could easily be messed up. But the dialogue back and forth between Nathan and Sully, I think, worked really well. Um... There was a cool transition that I think is only reserved for a fan film, and I would not want to see it in the movie version, which is when he jumps out the window and they switch the aspect ratio to look like gameplay. I think that works really well for a fan film because it's like, this is cool as a fan film, but if that were to happen in a movie, it'd feel really off-putting. Right. Um, so I think it was cool oh, for, yeah. Yeah, for the medium. Uh, the ending of it I think is really cool. Great cliffhanger. Um, I think Stephen Lang nailed Sully. Uh, I loved I loved his portrayal of him. Um, yeah, I thought it was really well done. I see it. People said that they did it for fun. People wouldn't put this many resources into doing something purely for fun. Uh, I think this is a way for them to kickstart, like, hey, we want to do something with Uncharted. Um, and obviously something might not happen with it, but I they didn't do this just to do it for fun. I, they, I think this is their way of saying, like, hey, maybe we can tell Sony or show Sony why people want an Uncharted movie so much and maybe some of us can get jobs for it kind of thing. Um, who knows? But, uh, yeah, that's my impressions on the on the fan film. I thought it was great. Uh, what about you, Dom, somebody who's played and loved the Uncharted series? Well, I, I, I definitely agree with your last point. Yeah, I mean, this wasn't just done. I mean, yeah, this they lost money on this. Someone lost money, right? Whoever was forking over the investment here. Lost, yeah. they, they put it on YouTube. Even if it gets a couple million views, Maybe it makes it, you know, a couple tens of thousands of dollars, but it had to cost like a million dollars or something to make this. I don't know. Dep- if you paid all the, the talent. Um, or if they, yeah. And, then, yeah. and <laughs> then they had like a film crew. Yeah, depending. Someone, when you if you look at like cost to revenue, someone, you know, didn't get what they put in necessarily. So, yeah, I agree that there's a purpose for this. Like no one does this for fun. Um, and that's a little much. But, yeah, this this was this was absolutely fantastic. Jared, this is that was like an, that's an Uncharted game. Like you just watched it, right? The only the only difference is uh, the production value, right? Yeah. I mean, with the fighting, the stunts, and everything, like the big and action the scope, set pieces, right? Where like yeah, right. And the scope of this is like you can tell. Oh, they they're starting at the house or whatever, right? And then they they drive, and it cuts, and then <laughs> they drive. You know, what I mean, then they're already at the next place, and it's still it's still a, on land contained area yeah right <laughs> and it's mexico so they can they can reproduce something that looks like mexico they can't reproduce you know freaking most uncharted locations on the same budget right um but yeah then the the action was really slow and it, it's just the production value which is way lower so that's it, it, that's kind of it, it speaks a lot to how how good the games are and their cinematic elements and even like the gameplay is higher production value like when you're fighting it feels better than it looked in this movie right um, yeah but everything everything that's okay right that's like you can't make you know wine out of shit um <laughs> that's a new phrase that i just am term, then coining um, yeah but the the things that were under their control were absolutely perfect right and they were you know beat for beat this was an uncharted game they made a little movie about it um this is all it needs to be i think i think you're right and this is probably kind of like to get someone's attention or to like you know as some kind of you know portfolio or to get a job i don't know but there's some some kind of you know root cause of why this happened but you know i don't want this to continue i wouldn't want you know a series of this right because the that lack in budget would would you'd feel that if this continued another 15 minutes you know yeah it would not feel good well 
Um, yeah. <laughs> So, going off of this, I want to talk about what we want from this or what we expect from this. And obviously, we don't want more of a fan film. And by that, we mean, like like you just said, the budget and all that stuff. The interesting thing here is, for me, is I would love to see, like, a Netflix series. And we know Netflix is really cool with giving people high budgets. They're just throwing money out to people now, which is really cool. Um, Adi Shankar, who's made the Castlevania animated series, has said that they're the greatest studio in the world for creatives. That they basically... They find people they trust to make a high quality product or a product because not everything on Netflix is necessarily high quality, but they find people they want to make stuff. They're like, how much do you need for your budget? And obviously, depending on the creator, they probably give more leeway. And they're like, we need this much money. And they're like, here, go ahead. And that's really cool for creatives, right? And for me, I think that obviously a, a Netflix Uncharted series wouldn't have the summer movie blockbuster budget but it would have a drastically higher budget than a fan film version of this. And I would love to see Nathan Fillion being him in a eight-episode uh, series on, of Uncharted, right? For me, that would be awesome. I, you can We can get to if you would want that or not. But the other thing I want to talk about is people are saying he's too old to play Nathan Drake in a real movie. He's too old. He's too old. I think there's a couple of ways they can get around that. One, I don't think he's that old. Obviously, they would hire a stuntman to do the actual stunts so it doesn't look as goofy as it does. Sorry, Nathan Fillion. You're a fantastic actor. The action stuff isn't for you, um, but that doesn't matter because you nailed everything else about Nathan. I could see the back of the head of an act, of a of a stunt double. I don't care about that, right? doesn't matter to me. Um, he can get in shape. You don't have to worry about that. If you get hired on a movie, they'll give you a diet. They'll do all that stuff. The way they can make him work, if it's not, say they don't want to have him just as the the headliner, because the truth of the matter is, as much as people love Nathan Fillion from Firefly and Sanctuary, he's not an A-list celebrity that'll bring in a lot of money at the box office, and people kind of have to realize that's just the way it works, right? Even if it's an Uncharted movie, having Nathan Fillion there, you're not going to get the people who are unfamiliar with Uncharted. That being said... My idea for how they can make this work, because we've already heard rumblings of Tom Holland being a young Nathan Drake, a very young one, uh, Nathan Drake. I would love if the way the movie was structured was that it kind of goes back and forth between old Nathan and young Nathan, and not a lot. Obviously, you want to time it out and, uh, perfectly, but I would love if like the A-line plot of the movie is Nathan as an older Nathan trying to figure out something, but it requires him to look through his memories of the past, and that's where you cut to Tom Holland's. So there's an A A plot and a B plot, and that would be great because you get the Nathan feeling that's distinctly Nathan. You can play around with Tom being Nathan and not necessarily having the mannerisms down off the get go because he hasn't come into his own own and he's a younger Nathan Drake. So you're you're kind of feeding both audiences of like, hey, you have this Hollywood A A list celebrity, and you also have the person that nails Nathan perfectly, right? Um, and I, I think that's really cool. I would really enjoy that, seeing an older Nathan and a younger Nathan, because as much as I would love a complete movie with Nathan Fillion, the reality of that is it's probably not going to happen. And I think the only way you can get it to where Nathan Fillion is Nathan Drake in a big budget summer blockbusters Uncharted movie is if it's the time manipulation looking back on his past kind of thing. I don't know. What do you think about all that, Dom? Netflix series yeah, and no. Uh, as far as Netflix series, I don't know. I don't know. I see this more as like a movie. I don't yeah. know if I can. I That's fine. Eight Completely episodes justified. even might be too much. Yeah. You know, and then even then, I still would. Yeah, they could get a good budget on Netflix, but I uh, will see. Well, I, I'd still be hesitant. What you right? want from True um, Uncharted is the big money. For those set pieces, cost right. a lot of money. Yeah. Right, and I don't know that that it would ever be <clears throat> that that investment would ever be worth it to any movie studio. I mean, I know they're supposedly making this Uncharted movie. I don't think it's ever going to actually happen. Um, but anyway, I think that's the right way to do it to have the big set pieces. I, I, no, I said it before though. I don't know that that it needs to exist, but if it does, I'd say that it should be a, a feature length movie, and that be it. Um, and that's that's how a game, that's how an Uncharted game kind of feels. Yeah. Um, I would imagine if you took out, you know, just the took out the gameplay and watched the cutscenes of a game, probably be a couple hours, closer to a movie length. Um, but obviously, like that wouldn't be the movie. You know, there's going to make it more cinematic than that. But um, I see it more as a movie length than a series. And as far as um, Nathan Fillion being, you know, in a movie, you know, in a big budget movie, I think you're right. <laughs> that would be the only way to do it. Even that seems unlikely. But if it were, then yeah, he would have to be. Um, 
it would be a split kind of thing where yeah it's flashbacks or flash forwards or whatever it is you know he's the he's nathan drake at the very end um but all the concerns about age i think are not really kind of like you were talking about it doesn't really matter none of that matters yeah. they can make he's not that old they can make him look a good bit younger right it's the bankable star thing for the budget that an uncharted movie exactly would need. you need like That's the a-list problem. celebrity yeah that's my mm-hmm. issue. And it's nothing against yep. Nathan Villian. Like, I think he's a tremendous actor, but that's just the reality of the situation. So I think, yeah, the, the working around that is getting the A-list celebrity of Tom mm-hmm. Holland, who's Spider-Man now, and everyone knows who Tom Holland is, and merging that with Nathan Fillion because, obviously, I think Tom Holland's a great actor. I think he's, next to Robert Downey Jr., I think he's probably one of the better actors in the MCU as a whole. And I think he would do the due diligent work to nail as close as he can to his version of Nathan Drake. But he can no, no, he can't get nowhere close to Nathan Fillion because Nathan Fillion just is inherently Nathan Drake. So I think balancing right. that would would help out both of them in a way. Um, but yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with you. But, I don't know if this movie ever happens, but that's how I would want it personally is both of them because that's the only way realistically it would be made. So, and I think there's that's a, there's good opportunity there. I'm trying to think when when he first meets Sully, but I don't think it's shown. Actually, it's when he's younger, but then there's a gap. Point being, Tom Holland to me kind of presents a really interesting opportunity because we've seen Nathan Drake as a kid in two of the games at slightly different ages, but still in Uncharted Four, I think he's in there as like a younger teenager. Um, yeah, Tom Holland, I could see playing Nathan Drake, you know, like in his twenties yeah. or something, right? Um, whereas Nathan Fillion, at best, you know, that's or any most other actors, you we think of Nathan Drake in his thirties, probably, right? Um, I would say mid thirties from what I've seen. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Tom Holland, I think that that presents an opportunity. Of like, what was Nathan Drake doing in his twenties? You know, I think there's some stuff there that would be cool to explore. And then I also am with you. I, I would trust Tom Holland uh, entirely to to handle it properly. Yeah, because and the thing too is Tom Holland's naturally charming, and that's what you need out of Nathan too. That's why oh, Nathan yeah. Fillion is yep. so good at it. Is because he's just mm-hmm. naturally charming. That's what you need. So, yeah, I'm not. People were upset about the the supposed casting of Tom Holland. I'm okay with that. I, that's my least of worries with the Uncharted movie is him being cast as Nathan Drake. Um, and obviously, I'm like I said, I'm nowhere near the fan that you are. But to hear that you're comfortable with it too is really cool. Um, I think that's pretty much it. We both loved the Uncharted fan film. Uh, what will happen from here on out, who knows? But Nathan Fillion and that crew just absolutely killed it. So good. Um, let's get into what we're going to be playing. So, going to be hitting up Octopath, going to be hitting up Hollow Knight. Uh, the thing I wanted to talk about that I previously was saying I was going to talk about now, I am a like middling f- uh, Mission Impossible fan, Dom. Like, I wouldn't say, like, oh, those movies are whatever, but I wouldn't say I'm like a diehard Mission Impossible fan. I'm, like, always, like, slightly interested. Um, Mission Impossible 6, which I don't remember the subtitle for off the top of my head. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good movie. I don't know where you sit on Mission Impossible movies. But Mission Impossible Fallout, Mission Impossible 7 Fallout, has Henry Cavill in it, who I like. Despite the DCEU being garbage, I like Henry Cavill. The writing and stuff isn't his fault. I just like him as an actor. I'm excited for him in this movie. He looks awesome. I love the him reloading his arms. Like gifts been everywhere over the internet in the in the bathroom fight scene. Um, and Tom Cruise is hit or miss for me, but I think he nails it in the Mission Impossible movies. And I can't wait to see this movie in IMAX. That's uh, 2D IMAX. Screw 3D. Uh, and the biggest thing is like on Rotten Tomatoes and all these review sites, it's scoring like in the 90s, which is really surprising to me. Um, and that has me pumped. So I'm just excited to see Mission Impossible. I'm totally not the bro action movie type of guy, but I'm really stoked for this one. All the all the signs like lined up perfectly for me to be interested in going to see this. So pretty much it for me. Uh, yeah. What about you? I've never seen any Mission Impossible Mission Impossible Possible. movies. <laughs> not a, not a one. Yeah. Yeah. And and I never really thought about it, but I, I might have seen one James Bond movie. I That's don't. They're I way want, too I, misogynistic for me. I do not like James Bond. Oh, probably. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't yeah. know anything about it. But um, I've never seen any Fast and Furious movies. I've never seen Die Hard movies. I'm not like. I just. I'm just kind of realizing this about myself. Apparently, I'm not a huge action movie fan. Yeah, I guess I'm not you know, either. Big, big action like those ones. I'm not a fan of Die Hard. I know that's blasphemous. People are like, "Oh, it's the greatest action movie ever." Not a fan of it. Fast and Furious or whatever to me. I go and watch them because my best friend's a huge fan. Um, I don't really like them that much there or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, what was the other series? Yeah. James Bond. Mm-hmm. 
for me personally, I know people are like, oh, Snowflake liberal, blah, blah, blah. They're way too misogynistic for me. Like, I just don't like the way Bond handles in his interactions with women. It's very old school, like, I'm the hero. Come over here and let me hold your butt kind of st- – it just rubs me the wrong way. I don't like it. Um, and it's very old-fashioned. It is what Bond that. is, but it's just like, eh, gross. Um, but like I said, the Mission Impossible movies, they there's enough, like, intrigue there, and they do some of the craziest stunts. That's why I like them because – just seeing them in IMAX, whether the movie's good or bad, some of the stuff they do in terms of, like, first time in cinematography and, like, film history, crazy stuff. Uh, and the fact that Tom Cruise does all his own stunts is really crazy, considering he's, like, over 50 years old. Um, Didn't know that. Yeah. This one looks really cool. It's getting really good reviews. The Mission Impossible movies aren't they, – they don't require you seeing all the other ones or whatever – um, I would look into it because like, I'm not a big fan of action movies either as we've had this discussion and I'm interested in watching it so maybe you would too maybe when it comes on the streaming service or whatever I don't know we'll see what about you though uh, it's just not gonna I'm just not gonna watch that man yeah. I'm just not gonna do it I'm just gonna tell you like it's not happening you what I will be doing watch Dark Knight Rises than watch this new uh, Mission Impossible oh yeah Dark Knight Rises is a great movie. It's not the oh, Dark Knight. How could it could never God. have held up? But it's still a, a phenomenal movie. Would you All re- three Dark Knight movies. So how do you rank them? Better Dark than Knight any begins? other superhero movie. That's crazy to me. Then Rises. Uh, yeah. I don't even think any of those are Nolan's the original best movie. Personally, I like I like the Prestige the most. Um, so I would say, what do you rank them? Actually, I got to see that one. It's very good. Night uh, begins Rises. Okay, that's how I'd rank him too. But for me, it's like it's Dark Knight's like a ten for me. Begins is like a seven, and then like Rises is like a four. I really don't like Rises. The whole like backbreaking thing, and then yeah. he's like it's all the of a sudden healed, and the Robin tease is like not even a tease. Whatever. This isn't the Batman podcast, anyways. Dumb. <laughs> what are you gonna be playing? Hollow Knight. I don't know how. I, I've gotta be. I've gotta be getting close to that. That, you know, not true ending that you talked about, yeah. I think. I gotta be. I gotta be, like, three quarters of the way to that, I think. Could be wrong. But we'll see. I, I'm, I'm gonna be playing this for a little while. Like, probably a few more weeks. Um, but that's, I mean, that's kind of like, I'll finish that Battlefront campaign like I talked about. But that's really, that's really what I'm looking at, you know? What's, you're not getting Spider-Man. What's the next big game you're getting? Red Dead? No, you're not even interested in Spider-Man. Red Dead, right? Oh, you are getting Spider Man. Cool. I didn't. I didn't know if you were getting it or not. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I'm on the. I'm on the Spider Man train, dude. There's a new trailer that dropped today. I don't know if you. I don't know. What, did we talk about? We didn't talk about that. Did you watch no, it? Yeah. I just kind of. Invo- I'm avoiding talking about it because it's so close to release. It has to do with like. I don't even want to know uh, if I want to mention the character that's featured because like to some people that's a spoiler. Yeah. So it's like I saw the trailer mm-hmm. though. Yeah. The. The thing I will say is they gave more uh, footage of the Mary Jane stuff, which we already knew was in the game, so that's not a spoiler. But it looks, like, Mm. super stealthy. Like, I'm really excited to, like, see how that breaks the flow of the game uh, in a good way of you, like, going through these, like, stealth sections of the Mary Jane. looks really interesting. Um, Yeah. Yeah, we will see. I'm into that. That's the next big one for me, really. I mean, I'm going to keep playing Hollow Knight. um, And I thought I was going to get into Elder Scrolls Online, but I might not have time before Spider-Man. A yep. month and a half? Oh, no, know. you we'll know see. what comes out before Spider-Man? We completely forgot. Uh, the final season of Walking Dead drops on August 14th. I, w- yeah, the first episode. So, yeah. I, yeah, I'll play that. I guess, and I said big game. Then another two months to the next one. Exactly. You know it would be crazy if they just, like, they, that release date came in, they're like, no, it's not one episode. We just dropped them all. Never happened for Telltale. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but imagine that. Like, you come to release date, and you're like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to play the first episode. It's just all five. I'd just be like, oh, God, just I mean, devour it immediately. You know, you say it's never happened from Telltale, but, I mean, everything that's ever happened never happened until it did. <laughs> just saying. Wise words with Dom. You can put that next to it in the quote box right next to you can't make wine out of shit. <laughs> can't do it. Catchphrases. Can't do it. Um, that- Even if you try, Nathan Fillion. That's it for episode 103 of the Controlled Interest Gamecast. Thank you guys for listening. If you can, please follow us on iTunes. Leave us a review there. It definitely helps. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Every subscription helps us get a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, a little bit wiser. Um, follow us on Twitter at CTRLINT. That's Controlled Interest abbreviated. I am at Jared underscore. Dom is at Dom's Oreos. You can often find me tweeting about how much I dislike the new Titans trailer. 
Uh, you can... It's ass. Yeah, not very good. Um, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, and yeah, we'll catch you guys next time. Hopefully Jordan will be back. He's having some car issues, so he wasn't able to join this this, this week. Uh, yeah, we'll catch you guys next time. Bye.